8. The Holy Trinity. Of the doctrine of the Trinity in history. The doctrine of the Trinity has always bristled with difficulties, and therefore it is no wonder that the Church in its attempt to formulate it was repeatedly tempted to rationalize it and to give a construction of it which failed to do justice to the scriptural data. 1. The Pre-Reformation Period. The Jews of Jesus' days strongly emphasized the unity of God, and this emphasis was carried over into the Christian Church. The result was that some ruled out the personal distinctions in the Godhead altogether, and that others failed to do full justice to the essential deity of the second and third persons of the Holy Trinity. Tertullian was the first to use the term Trinity and to formulate the doctrine, but his formulation was deficient, since it involved an unwarranted subordination of the Son to the Father. Oregon went even farther in this direction by teaching explicitly that the Son is subordinate to the Father in respect to essence, and that the Holy Spirit is subordinate even to the Son. He detracted from the essential deity of these two persons in the Godhead, and furnished a stepping stone to the Arians, who denied the deity of the Son and of the Holy Spirit by representing the Son as the first creature of the Father, and the Holy Spirit as the first creature of the Son. Thus the consubstantiality of the Son and the Holy Spirit with the Father was sacrificed, in order to preserve the unity of God, and the three persons of the Godhead were made to differ in rank. The Arians still retained a semblance of the doctrine of three persons in the Godhead, but this was sacrificed entirely by Monarchianism, partly in the interest of the unity of God and partly to maintain the deity of the Son. Dynamic Monarchianism saw in Jesus but a man and in the Holy Spirit a divine influence, while modalistic Monarchianism regarded the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, merely as three modes of manifestation successively assumed by the Godhead. On the other hand, there were also some who lost sight of the unity of God to such an extent that they landed in tritheism. Some of the later monophysites, such as John Asunages and John Philoponus, fell into this error. During the Middle Ages the nominalist, Rosalinus, was accused of the same error. The Church began to formulate its doctrine of the Trinity in the 4th century. The Council of Nicaea declared the Son to be co-essential with the Father, 325 AD, while the Council of Constantinople, 381 AD, asserted the deity of the Holy Spirit, though not with the same precision. As to the interrelation of the three it was officially professed that the Son is generated by the Father, and that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. In the East the doctrine of the Trinity found its fullest statement in the work of John of Damascus, and in the West, in Augustine's great work De Trinitate. The former still retains an element of subordination, which is entirely eliminated by the latter. 2 the post-Reformation period. We have no further development of the doctrine of the Trinity, but only encounter repeatedly some of the earlier erroneous constructions of it after the Reformation. The Arminians, Episcopius, Curselius, and Limburg, revived the doctrine of subordination, chiefly again, so it seems, to maintain the unity of the Godhead. They ascribed to the Father a certain pre-eminence over the other persons, in order, dignity, and power. A somewhat similar position was taken by Samuel Clarke in England and by the Lutheran theologian, Carnes. Others followed the way pointed out by Sibelius by teaching a species of modalism, as, for instance, Emanuel Swedenborg, who held that the eternal God-man became flesh in the Son, and operated through the Holy Spirit, Hegel, who speaks of the Father as God in himself, of the Son as God objectifying himself, and of the Holy Spirit as God returning unto himself, and Schleiermacher, who regards the three persons simply as three aspects of God, the Father is God as the underlying unity of all things, the Son is God as coming to conscious personality in man, and the Holy Spirit is God as living in the Church. The Sassinians of the days of the Reformation moved along Arian lines, but even went beyond Arius, by making Christ merely a man and the Holy Spirit but a power or influence. 
they were the forerunners of the Unitarians and also of the liberal theologians who speak of Jesus as a divine teacher and identify the Holy Spirit with the immanent God. Finally, there were also some who, since they regarded the statement of the doctrine of an ontological trinity as unintelligible, wanted to stop short of it and rest satisfied with the doctrine of an economic trinity, a trinity as revealed in the work of redemption and in human experience, as Moses Stewart, W. L. Alexander, and W. A. Brown. For a considerable time interest in the doctrine of the trinity waned, and theological discussions centered more particularly on the personality of God. Brunner and Barth have again called attention to its importance. The latter places it very much in the foreground, discussing it in connection with the doctrine of revelation, and devotes 220 pages of his dogmatics to it. Materially, he derives the doctrine from scripture, but, formally and logically, he finds that it is involved in the simple sentence, God speaks. He is revealer, father, revelation, son, and revealedness, Holy Spirit. He reveals himself, he is the revelation, and he is also the content of the revelation. God and his revelation identified. He remains God also in his revelation, absolutely free and sovereign. This view of Bath is not a species of Sabellianism, for he recognizes three persons in the Godhead. Moreover, he does not allow for any subordination, says he, thus, to the same God who in unimpaired unity is revealer, revelation, and revealedness, is also ascribed in unimpaired variety in himself precisely this threefold mode of being. The Doctrine of the Word of God, p. 344. Be God as Trinity in Unity. The word, Trinity, is not quite as expressive as the Holland word, dry in heat, for it may simply denote the state of being three, without any implication as to the unity of the three. It is generally understood, however, that, as a technical term in theology, it includes that idea. It goes without saying that, when we speak of the Trinity of God, we refer to a Trinity in unity, and to a unity that is trinal. 1. The Personality of God and the Trinity. As stated in the preceding, the communicable attributes of God stress his personality, since they reveal him as a rational and moral being. His life stands out clearly before us in Scripture as a personal life, and it is, of course, of the greatest importance to maintain the personality of God, for without it there can be no religion in the real sense of the word, no prayer, no personal communion, no trustful reliance and no confident hope. Since man is created in the image of God, we learn to understand something of the personal life of God from the contemplation of personality as we know it in man. We should be careful, however, not to set up man's personality as a standard by which the personality of God must be measured. The original form of personality is not in man but in God, his is archetypal, while man's is ectypal. The latter is not identical with the former, but does contain faint traces of similarity with it. We should not say that man is personal, while God is superpersonal, a very unfortunate term, for what is superpersonal is not personal, but rather, that what appears as imperfect in man exists in infinite perfection in God. The one outstanding difference between the two is that man is unipersonal, while God is tripersonal. And this tripersonal existence is a necessity in the divine being, and not in any sense the result of a choice of God. He could not exist in any other than the tripersonal form. This has been argued in various ways. It is very common to argue it from the idea of personality itself. Shedd bases his argument on the general self-consciousness of the triune God, as distinguished from the particular individual self-consciousness of each one of the persons in the Godhead, for in self-consciousness the subject must know itself as an object, and also perceive that it does. This is possible in God because of his trinal existence. He says that God could not be self-contemplating, self-cognitive, and self-communing, if he were not trinal in his constitution. Dome, Theol, I, pp. 393f, 251ff, 
178 ff. Bartlett presents in an interesting way a variety of considerations to prove that God is necessarily tripersonal. The Triune God, Part 2. The argument from personality, to prove at least a plurality in God, can be put in some such form as this. Among men the ego awakens to consciousness only by contact with the non-ego. Personality does not develop nor exist in isolation, but only in association with other persons. Hence it is not possible to conceive of personality in God apart from an association of equal persons in Him. His contact with His creatures would not account for His personality any more than man's contact with the animals would explain His personality. In virtue of the tripersonal existence of God, there is an infinite fullness of divine life in Him. Paul speaks of this pleroma, fullness, of the Godhead in E.P.H. 3.19 and Col. 1-9, 2 to 9. In view of the fact that there are three persons in God, it is better to say that God is personal than to speak of him as a person. 2. Scriptural proof for the doctrine of the Trinity. The doctrine of the Trinity is very decidedly a doctrine of revelation. It is true that human reason may suggest some thoughts to substantiate the doctrine, and that men have sometimes on purely philosophical grounds abandoned the idea of a bare unity in God, and introduce the idea of living movement and self-distinction. And it is also true that Christian experience would seem to demand some such construction of the doctrine of God. At the same time it is a doctrine which we would not have known, nor have been able to maintain with any degree of confidence, on the basis of experience alone, and which is brought to our knowledge only by God's special self-revelation. Therefore, it is of the utmost importance that we gather the scriptural proofs for it. A. Old Testament Proofs Some of the early church fathers and even some later theologians, disregarding the progressive character of God's revelation, gave the impression that the doctrine of the Trinity was completely revealed in the Old Testament. On the other hand, Socinians and Arminians were of the opinion that it was not found there at all. Both were mistaken. The Old Testament does not contain a full revelation of the Trinitarian existence of God, but does contain several indications of it. And this is exactly what might be expected. The Bible never deals with the doctrine of the Trinity as an abstract truth, but reveals the Trinitarian life in its various relations as a living reality, to a certain extent in connection with the works of creation and providence, but particularly in relation to the work of redemption. Its most fundamental revelation is a revelation given in facts rather than in words. And this revelation increases in clarity in the measure in which the redemptive work of God is more clearly revealed, as in the incarnation of the Son and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And the more the glorious reality of the Trinity stands out in the facts of history, the clearer the statements of the doctrine become. The fuller revelation of the Trinity in the New Testament is due to the fact that the Word became flesh, and that the Holy Spirit took up His abode in the Church. Proof for the Trinity has sometimes been found in the distinction of Jehovah and Elohim, and also in the plural Elohim, but the former is entirely unwarranted, and the latter is, to say the least, very dubious, though Rottenberg still maintains it in his work on De Trinitate in Israel's Godsbegrip pp. 19 ff. It is far more plausible that the passages in which God speaks of himself in the plural, general. 126, 11 to 7, contain an indication of personal distinctions in God, though even these do not point to a trinity but only to a plurality of persons. Still clearer indications of such personal distinctions are found in those passages which refer to the angel of Jehovah, who is on the one hand identified with Jehovah, and on the other hand distinguished from him, general. 16 to 7 minus 13, 18 to 1 minus 21, 19 to 1 minus 28, Mal. 3, 1, and also in passages in which the word or wisdom of God is personified, P's. 33 to 4, 6, Prov. 8, 12 minus 31. In some cases more than one person is mentioned, p's. 33 to 6, 45 to 6, 7, com. Heb. 
1 to 8, 9, and in others God is the speaker, and mentions both the Messiah and the Spirit, or the Messiah is the speaker who mentions both God and the Spirit, Isa. 48 to 16, 61 to 1, 63 to 9, 10. Thus, the Old Testament contains a clear anticipation of the fuller revelation of the Trinity in the New Testament. b. New Testament Proofs The New Testament carries with it a clearer revelation of the distinctions in the Godhead. If in the Old Testament Jehovah is represented as the Redeemer and Savior of his people, Job. 1925, Peace. 1914, 78 to 35, 106 to 21. Isa. 41 to 14, 43 to 3, 11, 14, 47 to 4, 49 to 7, 26, 60 to 16. Jer. 14 to 3, 50 to 14. Hoss. 13 to 3. In the New Testament, the Son of God clearly stands out in that capacity. Matt. 121. Luke chapter 1 verses 76 to 79. 217, John chapter 4 verse 42, Acts chapter 5 verse 3, Gal. 313, 4 to 5, Phil. 330, Tit. 213, 14. And if in the Old Testament it is Jehovah that dwells among Israel and in the hearts of those that fear him, Ps. 74 to 2, 135 to 21, Isa. 818, 57 to 15, Ezek. 43 to 7 minus 9. Joel chapter 3 verses 17, 21. Zech. 2 10, 11. In the New Testament it is the Holy Spirit that dwells in the church. Acts chapter 2 verse 4. Rom. 8 to 9, 11. Icor. 3 16. Gal. 4 to 6. Eph. 2 22. Jazz. 4 to 5. The New Testament offers the clear revelation of God sending his Son into the world, John chapter 3 verse 16, Gal. 4 to 4, Heb. 1 to 6, I John chapter 4 verse 9, and of both the Father and the Son, sending the Spirit, John chapter 14 verse 26, 15 26, 16 to 7, Gal. 4 to 6, we find the Father addressing the Son, Mark chapter 1 verse 11, Luke chapter 3 verse 22, the Son communing with the Father, Matt. 11:25, 26, 26 to 39, John chapter 11 verse 41, 12:27, 28, and the Holy Spirit praying to God in the hearts of believers, Rom. 8:26. Thus the separate persons of the Trinity are made to stand out clearly before our minds. At the baptism of the Son the Father speaks from heaven, and the Holy Spirit descends in the form of a dove, Matt. 316, 17. In the Great Commission Jesus mentions the three persons, baptizing them into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, Matt. 28-19. They are also named alongside of each other in I Cor. 12-4-6, 2 Cor. 13-14. And I Peter chapter 1 verse 2. The only passage speaking of triunity is I John chapter 5 verse 7, Orf. Ver. But this is of doubtful genuineness, and is therefore eliminated from the latest critical editions of the New Testament. 3. Statement of the Doctrine of the Trinity. The doctrine of the Trinity can best be discussed briefly in connection with various propositions, which constitute an epitome of the faith of the Church on this point. A. There is in the divine being but one indivisible essence, ousia, essentia. God is one in his essential being or constitutional nature. Some of the early church fathers used the term substantia as synonymous with essentia, but later writers avoided this use of it in view of the fact that in the Latin church, substantia was used as a rendering of hypostasis as well as of ousia, and was therefore ambiguous. At present the two terms, substance, and, essence, are often used interchangeably. There is no objection to this, provided we bear in mind that they have slightly different connotations. Shed distinguishes them as follows. Essence is from se, to be, 
and denotes energetic being. Substance is from substair, and denotes the latent possibility of being. The term essence describes God as a sum total of infinite perfections. The term substance describes him as the underlying ground of infinite activities. The first is, comparatively, an active word, the last, a passive. The first is, comparatively, a spiritual, the last a material term. We speak of material substance rather than of material essence. Dome, Theol, I, P. 271. Since the unity of God was already discussed in the preceding, it is not necessary to dwell on it in detail in the present connection. This proposition respecting the unity of God is based on such passages as Doi. 6 to 4. Jazz. 219. On the self existence and immutability of God, and on the fact that he is identified with his perfections as when he is called life, light, truth, righteousness, and so on. b. In this one divine being there are three persons or individual subsistences, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This is proved by the various passages referred to as substantiating the doctrine of the Trinity. To denote these distinctions in the Godhead, Greek writers generally employed the term hypostasis, while Latin authors used the term persona, and sometimes substantia. Because the former was apt to be misleading and the latter was ambiguous, the schoolmen coined the word subsistentia. The variety of the terms used points to the fact that their inadequacy was always felt. It is generally admitted that the word person is but an imperfect expression of the idea. In common parlance it denotes a separate rational and moral individual, possessed of self-consciousness, and conscious of his identity amid all changes. Experience teaches that where you have a person, you also have a distinct individual essence. Every person is a distinct and separate individual, in whom human nature is individualized. But in God there are no three individuals alongside of, and separate from, one another, but only personal self-distinctions within the divine essence, which is not only generically, but also numerically, one. Consequently many preferred to speak of three hypostases in God, three different modes, not of manifestation, as Sabalius taught, but of existence or subsistence. Thus Calvin says, by person, then, I mean a subsistence in the divine essence. A subsistence which, while related to the other two, is distinguished from them by incommunicable properties. Inst. I. 13, 6. This is perfectly permissible and may ward off misunderstanding, but should not cause us to lose sight of the fact that the self-distinctions in the divine being imply an I, and thou, and he, in the being of God, which assume personal relations to one another. Matt. 3, 16, 4 to 1, John chapter 1 verse 18, 3, 16, 5, 20 minus 22, 14, 26, 1526, 1613-15. C. The whole undivided essence of God belongs equally to each of the three persons. This means that the divine essence is not divided among the three persons, but is holy with all its perfection in each one of the persons, so that they have a numerical unity of essence. The divine nature is distinguished from the human nature in that it can subsist wholly and indivisibly in more than one person. While three persons among men have only a specific unity of nature or essence, that is, share in the same kind of nature or essence, the persons in the Godhead have a numerical unity of essence, that is, possess the identical essence. Human nature or essence may be regarded as a species, of which each man has an individual part, so that there is a specific from species unity but the divine nature is indivisible and therefore identical in the persons of the Godhead. It is numerically one and the same, and therefore the unity of the essence in the persons is a numerical unity. From this it follows that the divine essence is not an independent existence alongside of the three persons. It has no existence outside of and apart from the three persons. If it did, there would be no true unity, 
but a division that would lead into tetratheism. The personal distinction is one within the divine essence. This has, as it is usually termed, three modes of subsistence. Another conclusion which follows from the preceding, is that there can be no subordination as to essential being of the one person of the Godhead to the other, and therefore no difference in personal dignity. This must be maintained over against the subordinationism of Oregon and other early church fathers, and the Arminians, and of Clark and other Anglican theologians. The only subordination of which we can speak, is a subordination in respect to order and relationship. It is especially when we reflect on the relation of the three persons to the divine essence that all analogies fail us and we become deeply conscious of the fact that the Trinity is a mystery far beyond our comprehension. It is the incomprehensible glory of the Godhead. Just as human nature is too rich and too full to be embodied in a single individual, and comes to its adequate expression only in humanity as a whole so the divine being unfolds itself in its fullness only in its threefold subsistence of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. d. The subsistence and operation of the three persons in the divine being is marked by a certain definite order. There is a certain order in the ontological trinity. In personal subsistence the Father is first, the Son second, and the Holy Spirit third. It need hardly be said that this order does not pertain to any priority of time or of essential dignity, but only to the logical order of derivation. The Father is neither begotten by, nor proceeds from any other person, the Son is eternally begotten of the Father, and the Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son from all eternity. Generation and procession take place within the Divine Being and imply a certain subordination as to the manner of personal subsistence, but no subordination as far as the possession of the divine essence is concerned. This ontological trinity and its inherent order is the metaphysical basis of the economical trinity. It is but natural, therefore, that the order existing in the essential trinity should be reflected in the opera ad extra that are more particularly ascribed to each one of the persons. Scripture clearly indicates this order in the so-called prepositiona distinctionales, ek, dia, and en, which are used in expressing the idea that all things are out of the Father, through the Son, and in the Holy Spirit. e. There are certain personal attributes by which the three persons are distinguished. These are also called opera ad intra, because they are works within the divine being, which do not terminate on the creature. They are personal operations, which are not performed by the three persons jointly and which are incommunicable. Generation is an act of the Father only. Filiation belongs to the Son exclusively, and procession can only be ascribed to the Holy Spirit. As opera ad intra these works are distinguished from the opera ad extra, or those activities and effects by which the Trinity is manifested outwardly. These are never works of one person exclusively, but always works of the divine being as a whole. At the same time it is true that in the economical order of God's works some of the opera ad extra are ascribed more particularly to one person, and some more especially to another. Though they are all works of the three persons jointly, creation is ascribed primarily to the Father, redemption to the Son, and sanctification to the Holy Spirit. This order in the divine operations points back to the essential order in God and forms the basis for what is generally known as the economic trinity. f. The Church confesses the trinity to be a mystery beyond the comprehension of man. The trinity is a mystery, not merely in the biblical sense that it is a truth, which was formerly hidden but is now revealed, but in the sense that man cannot comprehend it and make it intelligible. It is intelligible in some of its relations and modes of manifestation, but unintelligible in its essential nature. The many efforts that were made to explain the mystery were speculative rather than theological. They invariably resulted in the development of tritheistic or modalistic conceptions of God, in the denial of either the unity of the divine essence or the reality of the personal distinctions within the essence. The real difficulty lies in the relation in which the persons in the Godhead stand to the divine essence and to one another, 
and this is a difficulty which the church cannot remove, but only try to reduce to its proper proportion by a proper definition of terms. It has never tried to explain the mystery of the Trinity, but only sought to formulate the doctrine of the Trinity in such a manner that the errors which endangered it were warded off. 4. Various analogies suggested to shed light on the subject. From the very earliest time of the Christian era attempts were made to shed light on the Trinitarian being of God, on the Trinity in unity and the unity in Trinity, by analogies drawn from several sources. While these are all defective, it cannot be denied that they were of some value in the Trinitarian discussion. This applies particularly to those derived from the constitutional nature, or from the psychology, of man. In view of the fact that man was created in the image of God, it is but natural to assume that, if there are some traces of the Trinitarian life in the creature, the clearest of these will be found in man. A. Some of these illustrations or analogies were taken from inanimate nature or from plant life, as the water of the fountain, the creek, and the river, or of the rising mist, the cloud, and the rain, or in the form of rain, snow, and ice, and as the tree with its root, trunk, and branches. These and all similar illustrations are very defective. The idea of personality is, of course, entirely wanting, and while they do furnish examples of a common nature or substance, they are not examples of a common essence which is present, not merely in part, but in its entirety, in each of its constituent parts or forms. b. Others of greater importance were drawn from the life of man, particularly from the constitution and the processes of the human mind. These were considered to be of special significance, because man is the image-bearer of God. To this class belong the psychological unity of the intellect, the affections, and the will, Augustine, the logical unity of thesis, antithesis, and synthesis, Hegel, and the metaphysical unity of subject, object, and subject-object, Olshausen, Shedd. In all of these we do have a certain trinity in unity, but no tripersonality in unity of substance. C. Attention has also been called to the nature of love, which presupposes a subject and an object, and calls for the union of these two, so that, when love has its perfect work, three elements are included. But it is easy to see that this analogy is faulty, since it co-ordinates two persons and a relationship. It does not illustrate a tripersonality at all. Moreover, it only refers to a quality and not at all to a substance possessed in common by the subject and the object. See the three persons considered separately. 1. The Father O R the first person in the Trinity. A. The name, Father, as applied to God. This name is not always used of God in the same sense in Scripture. 1. Sometimes it is applied to the triune God as the origin of all created things, I core. 8 to 6, EPH. 315, Heb. 12 to 9, Jazz. 117. While in these cases, the name applies to the triune God, it does refer more particularly to the first person, to whom the work of creation is more especially ascribed in Scripture. 2. The name is also ascribed to the triune God to express the theocratic relation in which he stands to Israel as his Old Testament people, doi. 32-6, Isa. 63-16, 64-8, Jer. 3-4, Mal. 1-6, 3. In the New Testament, the name is generally used to designate the triune God as the Father in an ethical sense of all his spiritual children, Matt. 545, 6-6-15, Rom. 8-16, I John chapter 3 verse 1. 4. In an entirely different sense, however, the name is applied to the first person of the Trinity in his relation to the second person, John chapter 1 verses 14, 18, 517-26, 854, 14, 12, 13. The first person is the father of the second in a metaphysical sense. This is the original fatherhood of God, of which all earthly fatherhood is but a faint reflection.
b. The distinctive property of the father. The personal property of the father is, negatively speaking, that he is not begotten or unbegotten, and positively speaking, the generation of the Son and the spiration of the Holy Spirit. It is true that spiration is also a work of the Son, but in him it is not combined with generation. Strictly speaking, the only work that is peculiar to the Father exclusively is that of active generation. c. The opera ad extra ascribed more particularly to the Father. All the opera ad extra of God are works of the triune God, but in some of these works the Father is evidently in the foreground, such as, 1. Designing the work of redemption, including election, of which the Son was himself an object, peace. 2 7-9, 40-6-9, 43-10, Matt. 1232, EPH. 1-3-6. 2. The works of creation and providence, especially in their initial stages, I call. 8 to 6, EPH. 2 to 9, 3, the work of representing the Trinity in the Council of Redemption, as the holy and righteous being, whose right was violated, Ps. 2 to 7 minus 9, 40 to 6 minus 9, John chapter 6 verses 37, 38, 17 to 4 minus 7. 2. The Son who are the second person in the Trinity. a. The name, Son, as applied to the second person. The second person in the Trinity is called, Son, or, Son of God, in more than one sense of the word. 1. In a metaphysical sense. This must be maintained over against Socinians and Unitarians, who reject the idea of a tri-personal Godhead, see in Jesus a mere man, and regard the name, Son of God, as applied to him primarily as an honorary title conferred upon him. It is quite evident that Jesus Christ is represented as the Son of God in Scripture, irrespective of his position and work as mediator. A, he is spoken of as the Son of God from a pre-incarnation standpoint, for instance in John chapter 1 verses 14, 18, Gal. 4-4. B. He is called the only begotten Son of God or of the Father, a term that would not apply to him. If he were the Son of God only in an official or in an ethical sense, John chapter 1 verses 14, 18, 3, 16, 18, I John chapter 4 verse 9. Compare 2 Sam 7 14, Job chapter 2 verse 1, Ps. 2 to 7, Luke chapter 3 verse 38, John chapter 1 verse 12. C. In some passages it is abundantly evident from the context that the name is indicative of the deity of Christ, John chapter 5 verses 18 to 25, Heb. 1. D. While Jesus teaches his disciples to speak of God, and to address him as, our Father, he himself speaks of him, and addresses him, simply as, Father, or, my Father, and thereby shows that he was conscious of a unique relationship to the Father, Matt. 6 to 9, 721, John chapter 20 verse 17. E, according to Matt. 1127, Jesus as the Son of God claims a unique knowledge of God, a knowledge such as no one else can possess. F, the Jews certainly understood Jesus to claim that he was the Son of God in a metaphysical sense, for they regarded the manner in which he spoke of himself as the Son of God as blasphemy, Matt. 26 to 63, John chapter 5 verse 18, 1036. 2. In an official or messianic sense. In some passages this meaning of the name is combined with the one previously mentioned. The following passages apply the name, Son of God, to Christ as mediator, Matt. 829, 26 to 63, where this meaning is combined with the other, 27 to 40, John chapter 1 verse 49, 11 27. This Messiah sonship is, of course, related to the original sonship of Christ. It was only because he was the essential and eternal Son of God, that he could be called the Son of God as Messiah. Moreover, the Messiah sonship reflects the eternal sonship of Christ. It is from the point of view of this Messiah sonship that God is even called the God of the Son, to core. 1131, 
EPH 1 to 3 and is sometimes mentioned as God in distinction from the Lord John chapter 17 verse 3 I call 8 to 6 EPH 4 to 5 6 3 in a nativistic sense the name son of God is given to Jesus also in view of the fact that he owed his birth to the paternity of God he was begotten according to his human nature by the supernatural operation of the Holy Spirit and is in that sense the Son of God this is clearly indicated in Luke chapter 1 verses 32 35 and may probably be inferred also from John chapter 1 verse 13 b the personal subsistence of the Son the personal subsistence of the Son must be maintained over against all modalists who in one way or another deny the personal distinctions in the Godhead. The personality of the Son may be substantiated as follows. 1. The way in which the Bible speaks of the Father and the Son alongside of each other implies that the one is just as personal as the other, and is also indicative of a personal relationship existing between the two. 2. The use of the appellatives, only begotten, and, firstborn, imply that the relation between the Father and the Son, while unique, can nevertheless be represented approximately as one of generation and birth. The name, firstborn, is found in Col. 1.15, Heb. 1-6, and emphasizes the fact of the eternal generation of the Son. It simply means that he was before all creation. 3. The distinctive use of the term, logos, in scripture points in the same direction. This term is applied to the Son, not in the first place to express his relation to the world, which is quite secondary, but to indicate the intimate relation in which he stands to the Father, the relation like that of a word to the speaker. In distinction from philosophy, the Bible represents the Logos as personal and identifies him with the Son of God, John chapter 1 verses 1 to 14, I John chapter 1 verses 1 to 3. 4. The description of the Son as the image, or even as the very image of God in 2 Cor. 4 to 4, Col. 1 15, Heb. 1 to 3. God clearly stands out in Scripture as a personal being. If the Son of God is the very image of God, he too must be a person. C. The eternal generation of the Son. The personal property of the Son is that he is eternally begotten of the Father briefly called, filiation, and shares with the Father in the spiration of the Spirit. The doctrine of the generation of the Son is suggested by the biblical representation of the first and second persons of the Trinity as standing in the relation of Father and Son to each other. Not only do the names, Father, and, Son, suggest the generation of the latter by the former, but the Son is also repeatedly called, the only begotten, John chapter 1 verses 14, 18, 3.16.18. Heb. 11.17. I John chapter 4 verse 9. Several particulars deserve emphasis in connection with the generation of the Son. 1. It is a necessary act of God. Oregon, one of the very first to speak of the generation of the Son, regarded it as an act dependent on the Father's will and therefore free. Others at various times expressed the same opinion. But it was clearly seen by Athanasius and others that a generation dependent on the optional will of the Father would make the existence of the Son contingent and thus rob him of his deity. Then the Son would not be equal to an homoousios with the Father, for the Father exists necessarily, and cannot be conceived of as non-existent. The generation of the Son must be regarded as a necessary and perfectly natural act of God. This does not mean that it is not related to the Father's will in any sense of the word. It is an act of the Father's necessary will, which merely means that his concomitant will takes perfect delight in it. 2. It is an eternal act of the Father. This naturally follows from the preceding. If the generation of the Son is a necessary act of the Father, so that it is impossible to conceive of him as not generating, it naturally shares in the eternity of the Father. This does not mean, however, that it is an act that was completed in the far distant past, but rather that it is a timeless act, the act of an eternal present, an act always continuing and yet ever completed.
Its eternity follows not only from the eternity of God, but also from the divine immutability and from the true deity of the Son. In addition to this it can be inferred from all those passages of Scripture which teach either the pre-existence of the Son or His equality with the Father, Mike. 5-2, John chapter 1 verses 14, 18, 3 16, 5 17, 18, 30, 36, Acts chapter 13 verse 33, John chapter 17 verse 5, Col. 1 16, Heb. 1-3. The statement of peace. 2 to 7, Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee, is generally quoted to prove the generation of the son, but, according to some, with rather doubtful propriety, cf. Acts chapter 13, verse 33, Heb. 1 to 5. They surmise that these words refer to the raising up of Jesus as messianic king, and to the recognition of him as son of God in an official sense and should probably be linked up with the promise found in 2 Sam. 7.14, just as they are in Heb. 1-5. 3. It is a generation of the personal subsistence rather than of the divine essence of the Son. Some have spoken as if the Father generated the essence of the Son, but this is equivalent to saying that He generated His own essence, for the essence of both the Father and the Son is exactly the same. It is better to say that the Father generates the personal subsistence of the Son, but thereby also communicates to Him the divine essence in its entirety. But in doing this we should guard against the idea that the Father first generated a second person, and then communicated the divine essence to this person, for that would lead to the conclusion that the Son was not generated out of the divine essence, but created out of nothing. In the work of generation there was a communication of essence, it was one indivisible act. And in virtue of this communication the Son also has life in Himself. This is in agreement with the statement of Jesus, for as the Father hath life in Himself, even so gave He to the Son also to have life in Himself, John chapter 5 verse 26. 4. It is a generation that must be conceived of as spiritual and divine. In opposition to the Arians, who insisted that the generation of the Son necessarily implied separation or division in the Divine Being, the Church Fathers stressed the fact that this generation must not be conceived in a physical and creaturely way, but should be regarded as spiritual and divine, excluding all idea of division or change. It brings distinctio and distributio, but no diversitas and divisio in the Divine Being. Bavinck the most striking analogy of it is found in man's thinking and speaking, and the Bible itself seems to point to this, when it speaks of the Son as the Logos. 5. The following definition may be given of the generation of the Son. It is that eternal and necessary act of the first person in the Trinity, whereby He, within the Divine Being, is the ground of a second personal subsistence like His own, and puts this second person in possession of the whole Divine Essence, without any division, alienation, or change. d. The Deity of the Son. The Deity of the Son was denied in the early Church by the Ebionites and the Elogi, and also by the dynamic Monarchians and the Arians. In the days of the Reformation the Sassinians followed their example, and spoke of Jesus as a mere man. The same position is taken by Schleiermacher and Rich, by a host of liberal scholars, particularly in Germany, by the Unitarians, and by the modernists and humanists of the present day. This denial is possible only for those who disregard the teachings of Scripture, for the Bible contains an abundance of evidence for the deity of Christ. This is very ably summed up in such works as Liddon's The Divinity of Our Lord, Warfield's The Lord of Glory, and W.M. C. Robinson's Our Lord. We find that Scripture, 1 explicitly asserts the deity of the Son in such passages as John chapter 1 verse 1, 20-28, Rom. 9-5, Phil. 2-6, Tit. 2-13, I John chapter 5 verse 20, 2, applies divine names to him, Isa. 9-6, 40-3, Jer. 23, 5, 6, Joel 2.32 Comp. Acts chapter 2 verse 21, I Tim. 
316, 3, ascribes to him divine attributes, such as eternal existence, Isa. 9 to 6, John chapter 1 verses 1, 2, Reverend. 1 to 8, 22 13, Omnipresence, Matt. 1820, 28 to 20, John chapter 3 verse 13, Omniscience, John chapter 2 verses 24, 25, 21 17, Reverend. 223, Omnipotence. Isa. 9 to 6, Phil. 321, Reverend. 1 to 8, Immutability, Heb. 110 minus 12, 13 to 8, and in general every attribute belonging to the Father, Col. 2 to 9, 4, speaks of him as doing divine works, as creation, John chapter 1 verses 3, 10, Col. 116, Heb. 1 to 2, 10, Providence, Luke chapter 10 verse 22, John chapter 3 verse 35, 17 to 2, EPH. 122, Col. 117, Heb. 1 to 3, The Forgiveness of Sins, Matt. 9 to 2 minus 7, Mark chapter 2 verses 7 to 10, Col. 313, Resurrection and Judgment, Matt. 25 to 31, 32, John chapter 5 verses 19 to 29, Acts chapter 10 verse 42, 1731, Phil. 321, 2 Tim. 4 to 1, The Final Dissolution and Renewal of All Things, Heb. 110 minus 12, Phil. 321, Reverend. 21 to 5, and, 5, Accords Him Divine Honor, John chapter 5 verses 22, 23, 14 to 1, I Cor. 15 19, 2 Cor. 13 13, Heb. 1 to 6, Matt. 28 to 19. E. The place of the Son in the economic trinity. It should be noted that the order of existence in the essential or ontological trinity is reflected in the economic trinity. The Son occupies the second place in the opera ad extra. If all things are out of the Father, they are through the Son, I call. 8 to 6. If the former is represented as the absolute cause of all things, the latter stands out clearly as the mediating cause. This applies in the natural sphere, where all things are created and maintained through the Son, John chapter 1 verses 3, 10, Heb. 1 to 2, 3. He is the light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world, John chapter 1 verse 9. It applies also to the work of redemption. In the council of redemption he takes upon himself to be surety for his people, and to execute the Father's plan of redemption, peace. 40 to 7, 8. He works this out more particularly in his incarnation, sufferings, and death, EPH. 1 to 3 minus 14. In connection with his function, the attributes of wisdom and power, I call. 124, Heb. 1 to 3, and of mercy and grace, are especially ascribed to him, 2 core. 1313. E.P.H. 5 to 2, 25. 3. The Holy Spirit O.R. the third person in the Trinity. A. The name applied to the third person of the Trinity. While we are told in John chapter 4 verse 24 that God is Spirit, the name is applied more particularly to the third person in the Trinity. The Hebrew term by which he is designated is Ruach, and the Greek Pneuma, both of which are, like the Latin Spiritus, derived from roots which mean, to breathe. Hence they can also be rendered, breath, general. 2 to 7, 6 17, Ezek. 37 to 5, 6, or, wind, general. 8 to 1, I Kings chapter 19 verse 11, John chapter 3 verse 8. The Old Testament generally uses the term, spirit, without any qualification, or speaks of, the Spirit of God, or, the Spirit of the Lord, and employs the term, Holy Spirit, only in peace. 51-11, Isa. 63-10, while in the New Testament this has become a far more common designation of the third person in the Trinity. It is a striking fact that, 
while the Old Testament repeatedly calls God, the Holy One of Israel, Ps. 71-22, Isa. 10-20, 41-14, 43-3, 48 to 17, the New Testament seldom applies the adjective, holy, to God in general, but uses it frequently to characterize the Spirit. This is in all probability due to the fact that it was especially in the Spirit and His sanctifying work that God revealed Himself as the Holy One. It is the Holy Spirit that takes up His abode in the hearts of believers, that separates them unto God, and that cleanses them from sin. b. The personality of the Holy Spirit. The terms, Spirit of God, or, Holy Spirit, do not suggest personality as much as the term, Son, does. Moreover, the person of the Holy Spirit did not appear in a clearly discernible personal form among men, as the person of the Son of God did. As a result the personality of the Holy Spirit was often called in question, and therefore deserves special attention. The personality of the Spirit was denied in the early church by the Monarchians and the Pneumatomachians. In this denial they were followed by the Socinians in the days of the Reformation. Still later Schleiermacher, Rich, the Unitarians, present-day modernists, and all modern Sabellians reject the personality of the Holy Spirit. It is often said in the present day that those passages which seem to imply the personality of the Holy Spirit simply contain personifications. But personifications are certainly rare in the prose writings of the New Testament and can easily be recognized. Moreover, such an explanation clearly destroys the sense of some of these passages, e.g. John chapter 14 verse 26, 16 to 7 minus 11, Rom. 8:26. Scripture proof for the personality of the Holy Spirit is quite sufficient. 1. Designations that are proper to personality are given to him. Though pneuma is neuter, yet the masculine pronoun echinos is used of the Spirit in John chapter 16 verse 14, and in E.P.H. 1.14 some of the best authorities have the masculine relative pronoun hos. Moreover, the name parakletos is applied to him, John chapter 14 verse 26, 15 26, 16 to 7, which cannot be translated by comfort, or be regarded as the name of any abstract influence. That a person is meant is indicated by the fact that the Holy Spirit as comforter is placed in juxtaposition with Christ as the comforter about to depart, to whom the same term is applied in I John chapter 2 verse 1. It is true that this term is followed by the neuters ho and auto in John chapter 14 verses 16 to 18, but this is due to the fact that pneuma intervenes. 2. The characteristics of a person are ascribed to him, such as intelligence, John chapter 14 verse 26, 15 26, Rom. 8 16, Wool, Acts chapter 16 verse 7, I core. 12 11, and affections, Isa. 63 to 10 eph 430 moreover he performs acts proper to personality he searches speaks testifies commands reveals strives creates makes intercession raises the dead etc general 1 to 2 6 to 3 luke chapter 12 verse 12 john chapter 14 verse 26 15 26 16 to 8 Acts chapter 8 verse 29, 13 to 2, Rom. 8 11, I core. 2 10, 11. What does all these things cannot be a mere power or influence, but must be a person? 3. He is represented as standing in such relations to other persons as imply his own personality. He is placed in juxtaposition with the apostles in Acts chapter 15 verse 28 with Christ in John chapter 16 verse 14, and with the Father and the Son in Matt. 28-19, 2 Cor. 13-13, I Pet. 1-1, 2, Jude chapter 20, 21. Sound exegesis requires that in these passages the Holy Spirit be regarded as a person. 4. There are also passages in which the Holy Spirit is distinguished from his own power, Luke chapter 1 verse 35, 4 14, Acts chapter 10 verse 38, Rom. 
1513. I Cor. 2-4. Such passages would become tautological, meaningless, and even absurd, if they were interpreted on the principle that the Holy Spirit is merely a power. This can be shown by substituting for the name, Holy Spirit, such a word as, power, or, influence. c. The relation of the Holy Spirit to the other persons in the Trinity. The early Trinitarian controversies led to the conclusion that the Holy Spirit, as well as the Son, is of the same essence as the Father, and is therefore consubstantial with Him. And the long-drawn dispute about the question, whether the Holy Spirit proceeded from the Father alone or also from the Son, was finally settled by the Synod of Toledo in 589 by adding the word filioque to the Latin version of the Constantinopolitan Creed, credimus in spiritum sanctum qui a patra filioque preceded, we believe in the Holy Spirit, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. This procession of the Holy Spirit, briefly called spiration, is his personal property. Much of what was said respecting the generation of the Son also applies to the spiration of the Holy Spirit, and need not be repeated. The following points of distinction between the two may be noted, however, 1. Generation is the work of the Father only. Spiration is the work of both the Father and the Son. 2. By generation the Son is enabled to take part in the work of spiration, but the Holy Spirit acquires no such power. 3. In logical order generation precedes spiration. It should be remembered, however, that all this implies no essential subordination of the Holy Spirit to the Son. In spiration as well as in generation, there is a communication of the whole of the divine essence, so that the Holy Spirit is on an equality with the Father and the Son. The doctrine of the procession of the Holy Spirit from the Father and the Son is based on John chapter 15 verse 26, and on the fact that the Spirit is also called the Spirit of Christ and of the Son, Rom. 8-9, Gal. 4-6, and is sent by Christ into the world. Spiration may be defined as that eternal and necessary act of the first and second persons in the Trinity whereby they, within the divine being, become the ground of the personal subsistence of the Holy Spirit, and put the third person in possession of the whole divine essence, without any division, alienation or change. P greater than less than P greater than the Holy Spirit stands in the closest possible relation to the other persons. In virtue of his procession from the Father and the Son the Spirit is represented as standing in the closest possible relation to both of the other persons. From I Cor. 2.10, 11, we may infer, not that the Spirit is the same as the self-consciousness of God, but that he is as closely connected with God the Father as the soul of man is with man. In 2 Cor. 3.17, we read, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Here the Lord, Christ, is identified with the Spirit, not with respect to personality, but as to manner of working. In the same passage the Spirit is called, the Spirit of the Lord. The work for which the Holy Spirit was sent into the Church on the day of Pentecost was based on His unity with the Father and the Son. He came as the Parakletos to take the place of Christ and to do His work on earth, that is, to teach, proclaim, testify, bear witness, etc., as the Son had done. Now in the case of the Son this revelational work rested on His unity with the Father. Just so the work of the Spirit is based on His unity with the Father and the Son, John chapter 16 verses 14, 15. Notice the words of Jesus in this passage, He shall glorify me, for he shall take of mine, and shall declare it unto you. All things whatsoever the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I, that he taketh of mine, and shall declare it unto you. D. The Deity of the Holy Spirit. The Deity of the Holy Spirit may be established from Scripture by a line of proof quite similar to that employed in connection with the Son. 1. Divine names are given to him. X. 17-7. Comp. Heb. 3-7-9. Acts chapter 5 verses 3, 4. I Cor. 3-16. 2 Tim. 3-16. Comp. 2 Pet. 121, 2, 
divine perfections are ascribed to him, such as omnipresence, peace. 139-7-10, omniscience, Isa. 40-13, 14, comp. Rom. 11-34, I-Cor. 2-10, 11, omnipotence, I-Cor. 12-11, Rom. 15-19, and eternity, Heb. 9-14. 3, divine works are performed by him, such as creation, general. 1-2, Job. 26 to 13, 33 to 4, providential renovation, peace. 104 to 30, regeneration, John chapter 3 verses 5, 6, tit. 3 to 5, and the resurrection of the dead, Rom. 8 to 11, 4, divine honor is also paid to him, Matt. 28 to 19, Rom. 9 to 1, 2 Cor. 13 13 e. The work of the Holy Spirit in the divine economy. There are certain works which are more particularly ascribed to the Holy Spirit, not only in the general economy of God, but also in the special economy of redemption. In general it may be said that it is the special task of the Holy Spirit to bring things to completion by acting immediately upon and in the creature. Just as he himself is the person who completes the Trinity, so his work is the completion of God's contact with his creatures and the consummation of the work of God in every sphere. It follows the work of the Son, just as the work of the Son follows that of the Father. It is important to bear this in mind, for if the work of the Holy Spirit is divorced from the objective work of the Son, false mysticism is bound to result. The work of the Holy Spirit includes the following in the natural sphere. 1. The generation of life. As being is out of the Father, and thought through the Son, so life is mediated by the Spirit, General. 1-3, Job. 26-13, Ps. 33-6, Ps. 104-30. In that respect he puts the finishing touch to the work of creation. 2. The general inspiration and qualification of men. The Holy Spirit inspires and qualifies men for their official tasks for work in science and art, etc., x. 28-3, 31-2, 3, 6, 35-35, Isam. 11-6, 6, 16-13, 14. Of even greater importance is the work of the Holy Spirit in the sphere of redemption. Here the following points may be mentioned. 1. The preparation and qualification of Christ for his mediatorial work. He prepared Christ a body and thus enabled him to become a sacrifice for sin. Luke chapter 1 verse 35. Heb. 10 to 5 minus 7. In the words, a body thou didst prepare for me, the writer of Hebrews follows the Septuagint. The meaning is, thou hast enabled me by the preparation of a holy body to become a real sacrifice. At his baptism Christ was anointed with the Holy Spirit, Luke chapter 3 verse 22 and received the qualifying gifts of the Holy Spirit without measure, John chapter 3 verse 24. 2. The inspiration of Scripture. The Holy Spirit inspired Scripture, and thus brought to men the special revelation of God, I call. 2.13, 2 Pet. 121, the knowledge of the work of redemption which is in Christ Jesus. 3. The formation and augmentation of the Church. The Holy Spirit forms and increases the Church, the mystical body of Jesus Christ, by regeneration and sanctification, and dwells in it as the principle of the new life, E.P.H. 122, 23, 222, I Cor. 3.16, 12-4 FF. 4. Teaching and guiding the Church. The Holy Spirit testifies to Christ and leads the Church in all the truth. By doing this he manifests the glory of God and of Christ, increases the knowledge of the Saviour, keeps the church from error, and prepares her for her eternal destiny, John chapter 14 verse 26, 1526, 1613, 14, Acts chapter 5 verse 32, Heb. 10:15, I John chapter 2 verse 27. Questions for further study. Does pagan literature contain any analogies of the doctrine of the Trinity?
does the development of the doctrine of the Trinity start from the ontological or from the economical Trinity? Can the economical Trinity be understood apart from the ontological? Why is the doctrine of the Trinity discussed by some as introductory to the doctrine of redemption? What is the Hegelian conception of the Trinity? How did Swedenborg conceive of it? Where do we find Sabellianism in modern theology? Why is it objectionable to hold that the Trinity is purely economical? What objections are there to the modern humanitarian conception of the Trinity? Why does Barth treat of the Trinity in the prolegomena to theology? What is the practical significance of the doctrine of the Trinity? Literature, Bavinck, Geref Dome. 2, pp. 260-347. Kuiper, Dict. Dome. De Dio 2, pp. 3-255. Voss. Geref. Dome. I, pp. 36-81. Maastricht, Gottschleidheit I, pp. 576-662, Turretin, Opera, Locus Tertius, Hodge, Sist. Theol, I, pp. 442-534, Dabney, Sist. And Palem, Theol, pp. 174-211, Curtis, The C.H.R. Faith, pp. 483 to 510. Harris, God, Creator and Lord of All, I, pp. 194 to 407. Illingworth, The Doctrine of the Trinity, Adonai, The Christian Conception of God, pp. 215 to 246. Steenstra, The Being of God as Unity and Trinity, pp. 159 to 269. Clark, the C.H.R. Dot. Of God, pp. 227-248. Bartlett, The Triune God, Lydon, The Divinity of Our Lord, Macintosh, The Doctrine of the Person of Jesus Christ, Warfield, The Lord of Glory, Ibbard, The Spirit of God in the Old Testament, and The Biblical Doctrine of the Trinity, Both in Biblical Doctrines, pp. 101 ff. Ibbard, Calvin's Doctrine of the Trinity, in Calvin and Calvinism, Kuiper, Het Werk van den Heiligen Geest, C.F. Index. Owen, A Discourse Concerning the Holy Spirit, C.F. Index. Smeaton, The Dopt. Of the Holy Spirit. Paula Preuss, The Divine Trinity.